I'm a Juma Nasenyana. I'm from Trokana. My name is Ajuma Nasenyana. I was born in Lodwa, Trokana. Um, I became a fashion model. I think, as you know me, <laughs> everybody knows me as the, the Kenyan um, international model. This is home and this is where I feel safe and secure and happy. So, I mean, definitely home was where I was going to end up at the end of it all. Yes, so I'm back home. I set up a casting and modeling agency and um, the modeling agency was mainly to create a path between um, local models with high fashion potential to the international industry. So yeah, we, we, I did that for a little while, but then I went into, cast, into um, commercial casting. So my big thing right now is um, advertising. I do casting and, um, and, um, and cast directing for um, commercials and of course um, print billboards as well. The industry is a bit difficult, so we've, we've experienced quite a bit of um, a rough patch, I mean for a, 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 like a couple of years now, so it's been a bit difficult, I mean, getting, you know, doing that tran tran transition from the local industry to the, to, the, to, to the international industry. And then also, I mean, with the economic crisis that has been hitting, you know, the world, I mean, it's been, it's been going on for quite a while now, so I just felt like it's not, I mean, it hasn't been really secure and I didn't feel like, um, um, I didn't feel in that position to actually pluck a girl from home and take them there and maybe they're not going to be able to, you know, achieve their dream or what they wanted because of the economic um, crisis right now and also it's been going on for a bit uh, so anyways I felt like I had I was I mean I was given an, a, a chance to get to go out there I was just a little village girl from Lodwa but somehow I was blessed with this um, opportunity to, to get out of that village go and get a, a, a good education I went to a, a, I mean private British school I mean I was yeah British school and then after that I got this opportunity to become a model you know it's it's like I mean, out of all my friends that, uh, that, that I was with back home, I was the only one, you know? So those guys, I mean, my, my life and my friends in the village is so totally different. They are still living the village life, traditional. Some have even been married off with cattle and things like this. And um, this girl who has been to New York, I mean, went to fancy schools and things like that. So it's, it was like, what do you call it? A, a pin in a, a needle in a haystack, more or less. So I felt like I had, because I got that opportunity, I felt an obligation to, this, to, to the younger, I mean, to those girls who are looking up, up to me at home. I felt I had, there was just that urge inside of me, I have to go and give back. I have, these girls are looking for a way, you know, they're looking for guidance and I have done it all, I've experienced it. I feel like I'm in a position to do that for them. One of my projects I, I, I are, is called Beauty Without Borders. That project is based in the refugee camp in Kakoma. I am also I also feel obligated because I am from the host community. I, I, I feel also obligated to the, to the youth within who live within the refugee camp. So one of the projects I have there, like I said, is called Beauty Without Borders. What I do is that I bring professionals from from the different um, the different fields within my industry, which is makeup artistry, um, hair I mean hair 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 stylist. There is, um, of course, um, designing, photography, and then obviously modeling. So we all come together. We go into the, into the refugee camp. We're just trying to, f to get them um, stand on their own two feet. So what we do, we go and teach them these skills where they're able now to, you know, make it, just make it lucrative for themselves. So what they do, they can actually, when, when the UN staff come, they can actually design their clothes. They can, you know, um, make, do um, makeup for, for, for um, weddings and so on, you know, or put up their own salons after we are gone. But the, the, most, the best one was, of course, I had, I had the modeling part of it. So I went and I trained models. I put them, I, I brought them from the refugee camp. I brought them for a fashion show in Nairobi. We did pictures. We post them on our, on our social media platforms. Benetton actually booked one of the girls from Paris. <laughs> yes. 
So they were calling, we, we, we had a conversation and so on. When I went back to get the girl, her phone was off. So I started looking for her now, trying to find her. Then eventually, somebody called me back and told me the girl had been married off. She was just stolen, like literally. People just, she, she, they just found her, like in a, imagine, they literally just like ambushed her. They started dressing her in all these like wedding, wedding dresses, South Sudanese wedding dress, make, makeup, and they told her, let's go, we're going to your auntie's place. And when they arrived there, the man was already waiting for her over there. Yes, so they, they did whatever it is. The man had already paid her father in South Sudan. So now the deal was done and there was nothing she could do. So they, they just ran away with her back to South Sudan. And later on, somehow she found my number and she was just begging me, like, please help me, you know, I don't know what to do. Then of course I tried to call, I'm not gonna mention names, an organization to try to help. They said she was already over 18. She's an adult, there was nothing really they could do. I think I was born a philanthropist because I remember even when I was small, even in primary school, do you know what I used to do? I used to, <laughs> like in my village, at least we had, a, I mean, we had a little bit more than the surrounding families. So what I used to do when I was, when I was small, I used to bring, like round up children from the village, bring, bring them home. I used to feed them, the little ones, feed them, wash them, put them to sleep. So I was like a volunteer nanny when the, when the mothers have gone to collect firewood and so on. And then even when I used to go to school, you know my pocket money, when the other children spent it on candy and soda and everything, I always saved my money. When I finished at the end of the term, I used to go into town, like on my way to Trocana. We used to go stop somewhere in Kitalia. I go into the market. I used to buy clothes for the children and take them back to them. And you know, I've always, every time I used to do that. So I think it's something that I've just always had with in, inside of me. That part where I mean, that giving back has just always been with me. I don't know. It's good and bad at the same time. I mean, it's good. It's good in a fact that, of course, in in the sense that. You know, you're, you're helping those who, who need it the most. But then at the same time, maybe sometimes you overstretch and forget about yourself. <laughs> those, yeah, we are the, I'm that kind of person. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. So Ajuma, Ajuma Foundation, like I said, I started it as more or less, um, like I felt like it started with me, actually. It started with me and my, it's not insecurities, but I was teased because I was dark. I was not beautiful, I considered ugly, you know all these kind of things, kids tease me, funny names and so on. So I've always had that thing, that thing at the back of my mind in my subconscious that I didn't, I didn't feel good about myself or the way I looked, right? But I managed to power through and, event, and I became this fashion model. I was on Times Square, I mean, all of a sudden I'm this beautiful girl, everybody's like, you know, I'm on covers of magazines and so on. So I felt like, you know what, I mean, it was so hard for me, even though I pretended to be strong, it was, it really affected me a lot. So I felt like, okay, there's some other girls going through what I'm going, what, what I went through, you know, back then. So I felt I, I need to go and um, mentor and uplift girls, you know, to appreciate themselves, to love themselves just the way they are, because they are beautiful as they are. You know, nobody else should, nobody should tell you how you're supposed to, be, to look or what beauty is. Beauty is within you and it's about how you feel about yourself. So that, is, that was the start of the Ajuma Foundation, upliftment, you know, for people to appreciate them, girls, little young girls to appreciate themselves. Speaking against colorism is very important to me because I don't choose what color I'm going to be, right? <laughs> I mean, this is me, I was born like this. I mean, I, I, don't choose, I don't choose that. So, I mean, I think it's wrong for somebody to judge you because of, you know, your skin color. Because, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, you know? I didn't choose who my parents are going to be or if they're going to be light-skinned, dark-skinned, yellow. I, I, I don't get to choose that. I'm sorry. So that is why, I mean, people just need to appreciate people the way they are, the way they come into this world. We are all beautiful just the way we are. Now going to the grassroots level, what I'm doing is that I'm more or less meeting the needs at a grassroots level. What do they need? 
when it comes to girls, maybe sanitary pads, for example. And of course, we are also, we have fun, so much fun. Some of them want to model, so I teach them how to pose. They tease me when I'm walking and things like that. So it's more or less, it's just like a mentorship time. It's time for them to see me, to, for me to tell them, look at me. I came from here. Look where I am today. You can also do it. You know, you can also, also make it just like me. So don't, you, you shouldn't lose hope. You never know what life has in store for you. Just don't like, oh, after class five, class seven, you go and you're like, you know what, I give up. I'm going to go and have my babies. No, there's still so much in store for you. So that's the main thing that I try to, you know, put out there to the girls when I'm interacting with them on, the, on a grassroots level. Um, most of these children, they only have one, one notebook, school, no, school notebook to write on. Um, so that is where everything goes in. So these children, I'm, I'm really, really glad that I'm here today to give them some extra books because every lesson should have their, its own um, notebook. So yeah, today that's what we're going to do for them today. Give them adequate supply of um, notebooks. So when the pandemic happened, everything shut down. It gave us so much time to reflect, whether it's the, through our anxiety, depression, whatever you are going through, you, it just forced you into that corner where you're going to reflect. And for me, it was like, me, I'm always on, like, how can I, you know, when there's a crisis, how can I come in? How can I play a role? I mean, I felt like, you know what, those low income families and people in rural areas, what their main focus is going to be right now is to survive food on the table. That is what they're going to be focusing on. So things like education will be out of the window, right? Because, you know, are you going to buy the child a pen or a book or is, are you going to give him food, right? Of course, you're going to give the child food. So I was like, okay, how can I at least, you know, um, come in, come in so the child doesn't have to, to, to miss out on school. So I came up with this idea where I'm going to be giving out free exercise books. And another reason why I did the exercise book, growing up, I always saw children writing on the floor, on the ground, when they are teaching under a tree, they don't have books they're writing on, on the ground, or kids being chased away from school because they don't have books. And then there was a time now, like maybe a year or two, a year ago or something, I was just taking a casual walk around, I mean, in my village, and I saw a little girl, like around seven years old. She was crying walking back from school. It was a bit like dawn, crying walking back towards me. I was like, Nini, what's wrong? She's like, oh, I've been chased. I mean, I've, the, the, the teacher threw me out of class because I don't have an exercise book. Oh, you go so sad, and she was so sweet. So I took her to the, just a nearby kiosk. I bought her a couple of books, and I took her back to school. And oh, was, I mean, and it was so it didn't even cost me much, you know? So I was like, okay, this is something that, I mean, now with the pandemic, I'm sure it's much, much worse. Now a lot of children are gonna be sitting out of school. So that is how I came out of the exercise book, um, the exercise book initiative, where I wanted to give, um, you know, just to give the kids adequate books in order for them to continue, you know, so they don't have to miss out in school. Yeah. I promise you, I have samples and I have a table. So, I have a table. Okay. Yes. So, these exercise books are not just any other exercise books. They are very, very they're special to me. Very special to me. And this is because I have um, captured also our culture within the books. Do you know, one of the th another thing why, I mean, why I have captured our culture and our languages in, 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 within our books is because, I mean, imagine my cousins who live in Lodwa. They have never left the village. I talk to them in Trokana. Me, um, I left when I was like six, six, seven years old. I've been away for like such a long time, but I'm still fluent in Trokana. But now going back home, I'm talking to my little cousins or, okay, my big cousins, whether they are teenagers or something. In Trokana, they're answering to me, they're replying to me in, in Swahili. I'm just like, no, 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 no. It's not right. It's not right. So we are losing our culture. We are losing our language. Less people are talking our different languages. So I felt like I needed to incorporate that into the books just to get people to start embracing our cultures again, especially the youth, starting with the younger generation. And also, um, Another thing is like, okay, Kenya is notorious when it comes to um, um, post-election, I mean, election violence. I know we have another a cycle coming up um, next year. So I felt like I wanted to set the groundwork of promoting peace and tribal unity as well and through this book. So these books, books carry so much, you know, they carry a lot. They carry our culture, our languages, our tribal unity, and you know, it, they are just me. 
that is what that is me <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i'm like i'm passionate about kenya i'm passionate about our culture passionate about our country and and um, i'm passionate about um, our country um us living together in peace how many masai studio i love what happened you my peer no i so we have the Trokana book. Yes, she's called um, Akidor. <laughs> they also have their names. Um, at the back, I have um, I, I have put the greetings for the children so they know the next time they see a Trokana what to say. I've also um, I shown them where in in Kenya the Trokana people come from. Um, I have Mumbi. <laughs> she's so beautiful, isn't she? Yeah. So this is Mumbi. So I also have where, I, I also sh I show the kids where the Kikuyu come from and then also with their greetings. The next time they see a Kikuyu, they greet in Kikuyu. This is Nasangai, the Samburu girl. <laughs> At the back is the same thing, where the Samburu come from and also how to greet in Samburu. Um, so here we re we're representing also Mombasa, I mean um, the Swahili. Um, she's called Princess Pendo. <laughs> At the back, we also have, uh, we, we, the, we get to show the children where the Swahili come from. And then also we have the greetings in, um, of course, in Swahili as well. And then finally, I've only gotten to get to, I've done five tribes so far, but I'm going to get through um, the rest of them as well. But finally, the fifth tribe I've done is um, Maasai. <laughs> yeah. hmm? She's called um, Nasarian. At the back, the kids can see where the Maasai people come from and then also the greetings in, Swahi, in, in, in Maasai. The next time they see a Maasai, they know exactly what to say. Yes. <laughs> so the thing is, I've gone, I've given, I've given out the books. There's so much, I mean, I've, I've discovered this, the other challenges that these children are going through. There are some schools that found children. Children walk like 10 kilometers a day. They are small, they're like three years, five years, and then they follow their, their their elder siblings and the teachers say they come because they, they're hoping to get a meal and imagine there is no food in school as well so imagine walking eight hours a day and then you don't get you know th there's nothing to eat so i found some of the kids were so lethargic low spirited was really really sad i mean there was pregnant girls oh my goodness that was the sad sad one a little little girl 13 year old she was about six months pregnant you know it touched me so bad because that was my mother you see, my mother was that child and I was that unborn child. I was, I was the product of, you know, of a, of a primary girl that um, was pregnant. My mother was kicked out of, you know, the, the homestead by her father. So she was roaming around the village with me, you know, trying to get help and so on. So I saw myself, I mean, I felt for that girl so much. And some of them, like, they're cooking meals under a tree. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's so much. So I felt like, you know what, we need more help. We need, you know, we need more support. We need people to like, you know, we need Kenyans to come in. You know, we don't need to look out into, you know, the Western world all the time. Even within, you know, within us, even a small, you know, sometimes somebody thinks a hundred bob is not gonna go a long way. Let me not give because it's so little. No, if, if like everybody gave a hundred bob, of course, you know, I, I can get enough supplies, school supplies, or I'm even able to build, you know, a kitchen for these children. You know, I'm even, I, I don't know, get them shoes there's a lot more that is needed kunam to like when i was fundraising during christmas somebody gave me a hundred bob i'm still looking for that guy i think it's like my taxi my taxi guy or my avocado man <laughs> i was so touched I, I decided to branch up and see how else can i you know can i fundraise and add on and sustain the project so i've started making certain like journals also for other people like older people they can you can buy a journal we are on our social media, Ajuma Foundation, or you can, you can even hit me up on Ajuma, Ajuma Nasanyana on social media. Um, we will also, I think you'll put our contacts as well. Yes, or on our phone number, our email addresses, you can order your journals. Also, you can also order books for your children, because seriously, let's embrace our own, our cultures, our children, even, even you guys at home, I mean, even the affluent, those guys in Brayburn and in, in, in Brookhouse, wherever, even the affluent families, I feel like they can also, I mean, they can also benefit, their children can also benefit from these books. So one of the quotes I like is, um, it says that suffering turned into compassion is the truest form of empathy. So I think, I mean, I've been purified through hardship. So I know, I know what it is to, you know, to go through hard times, 
not to have what you need. So I, 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 I feel like, I mean, I, I, I relate with a lot of people, like a lot of people, of course, in rural areas especially, because that is where I, I, I come from. Just focus on that, where you are, and take one step at a time, and you will get through it. The, the world is there is a big oyster. There is, there is so many possibilities out there for you.